So let's talk about chemostratigraphy. Chemostratigraphy is the science of using the chemistry of sediments to define chronostratigraphic units and thus to be able to trace events across the, the planets, across continents, using the chemistry of those sediments. Now, very often, what we use for chemostratigraphy are isotopic system and in particular stable isotopes. So we'll focus a lot on stable isotope in this class. The other thing to know about chemostratigraphy and stable isotope is that we can often use them, not always, but we'll see a lot of systems where it is possible to use isotopes to trace the same event on land and in the ocean. So that is a great tool to be able to trace across different um, different uh, types of environment of deposition, even from the ocean to the land. So stable isotopes, what does that mean? Well, it means that the, the isotopes are stable. They don't decay. They don't transform into something else. This is not carbon-14 that decays and gives you a clock to measure time. So that's not the approach we're taking here. Instead, what we are looking at is stable isotope that have essentially the same number of proton and electron between each other, but differ in terms of number of neutrons. So they differ by mass. And because they differ by mass, these isotopes will tend to be fractionated, separated based on their mass. So what are stable isotopes? How do we measure them? How do we report them? What do they mean for carbonates? So uh, sadly, the Jodas resolution does not have a stable isotope lab. So we cannot stay on this ship and go see their stable isotope lab. However, I do have one in London. So let me change into something a little bit more formal. I'll go on a helipad, jump on a helicopter, fly back to London, and I'll meet you in my lab. I'm standing here in my stable isotope lab, which I call the clumped isotope lab. We use the delta notation to report those isotopes. So the delta notation is relatively simple, but it's important to understand it. So for instance, if we look at delta O18, we always refer to the heavier isotope in a system. So in, in oxygen, we have O16, O18. We also have O17, but we cannot measure it. So we correct for O17. So I'll spare you the detail on this one. So we have the heavy O18, which is rare. The, the heavy isotope usually is the rare species. And we have the light O16, which is the most abundant. 99, 98% of, of oxygen is O16. And the delta notation consists of reporting the ratio of those elements relative to a standard. And why do we use this notation? It's because if we were to report the absolute value, first of all, the ratio, the numbers would be very, very small. So it, it would be hard to read and remember. And second, it's very difficult to measure a ratio accurately. What's much easier to measure in a modern mass spectrometer like the ones behind me is the difference between the ratio measured in a standard that we know the composition of or that we, we determine the composition at, a, at a, an arbitrary value and our sample. So in the delta notation, what we do is we do the ratio of the sample minus the ratio of the standard. All of this divided by the ratio of the standard times 1000. And the reason we use time 1000 is to make the number easy to read. And it's also why this is expressed. The, the notation unit is called the per mil. So now this comes down for oxygen isotopes to the ratio of O18 to O16 in the sample minus the ratio of O18 to O16 in the standard. And this all of this divided by the ratio of O18 to O16 in the standard time 1000. So let's try to think about the implication of this notation. If your sample and your standards are the same, these two terms will come to zero. And if these two terms come to zero, the whole delta value comes to zero. If the sample has more O18 than the standard, these two terms will give you a positive number. And so the delta will become positive. If the sample has less O18 than the standard, then these two terms become lower, they become negative, they become less than zero, and so your delta notation, your delta values will be less than zero. So in other words, the delta is exactly what its name implicates. It's a difference between the sample and the standard. And 
We know that if we have negative values, we're below the standard that we use. And if we have positive values, we are above the standard that we use. And for carbon isotopes, we do exactly the same. So we also use the delta notation. This is the delta notation for carbon. And the heavy rare isotope of carbon is C13. The light, more common, 98%, 99% of carbon is C12. But the ratio is exactly the same. It's C13 to C12 of sample minus C13 to C12 of standard divided by this whole thing divided by C13, C12 standard times 1000. So one thing I've not mentioned yet is what are the standards we use to report our isotopic uh, values. And in carbonates, or in, in the topic of carbonate diagenesis, there is really only two standards or scales we're interested in. One is known as the SMO scale. SMO stands for Standard Mean Ocean Water. And it's exactly what its name indicates. It's basically a, a collection of water from all around the world that was mixed together and is used as a standard. Okay, And we assign the value zero to that standard. Now in SMO, because it's water, it's made up of H2O. So it's a great standard for hydrogen and oxygen, but not for carbon. So you can only use SMO to report fluid values. Okay, You can only use SMO when you want to talk about the oxygen value of a fluid. You can use SMO to report the oxygen value of carbonate, but it's not as common, although you, you can find it. What you cannot do is use SMO to report a carbon value because there is no carbon in seawater. Okay, seawater H2O, and there's no carbon in this formula. So, so that's important to know. When it comes to standard for carbonates and not just for the waters, we prefer to look at a material that is closer to what we measure. So we take a carbonate as our standard and the standard carbonate reference frame that everybody is using is the PDB reference frame. Now that stands for the PD belemnite and it's because originally this material was a belemnite coming from the PD formation in the US. So that's the term PDB comes from, from uh, this. You might also have seen the term VSMO and VPDB. The V stands for Vienna, where a lot of the international standards are kept. So, so that's there's no mystery there. The value of the PDB belemnite is set by convention at zero per mil. And so if you have a carbonate that plots higher, it means that it has more oxygen 18 compared to O16 than the Mesozoic belemnite, so the Mesozoic ocean, if you want. And of course, the reverse, if your carbonate plots in the, in the negative zone below zero, it means that the sample you measure has less O18 to O16 compared to that Mesozoic marine belemnite.